Bible students, the idea of this particular presentation is to see how the idea of the Dead Sea Scrolls and all the things that we have learned about them and the significance of them fits into the bigger plan. The bigger plan being how does it relate to us? How does it relate to our faith? How does it relate to, to seeing that God is working in the world that we live in and that the days until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ are few. All of those things are, are part of this idea that we're going to be talking about, the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in particular, uh, as it's being classified by other people who know a lot more about archaeology than me, the greatest archaeological discovery of all time. So that's quite a, a bill to fill, but really, I think it does. And if you can see the picture of the cave behind me, you will see a little bit of what we are going to be talking about in, in the immediate slides. Because there were 11 caves somewhat like this in which the scrolls were found. There was something like 19,000 fragments it's a, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that there were scrolls found because really there was only one complete biblical scroll that was found. There were others that were sort of, you know, almost complete, but most of them were just fragments that had been cut up, that had been, uh, well, they, I guess they were in various states of decay. And as a result, it was a big jigsaw puzzle to try to put these things together. What also is interesting is there were something like a pieces to 800 different scrolls found in those 11 caves, but only 200 of them were biblical. And that's something else that we need to clear up because most people think that all the scrolls were biblical. No, there were many that weren't. And, you know, that has led to the fact that most of the people who have wrote about this have written about the 600 scrolls that weren't biblical because they were trying to piece together who were these people that hid these scrolls? What was their civilization like? What can we learn from these people? Whereas I think our primary interest is what did those scrolls say that were biblical? And you'll see what I mean a little later on. The scrolls were written on four materials. There was the skin of animals, papyrus, copper, and lead. And there were four languages. There was the ancient Hebrew script, there was Hebrew, the more modern version of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And these were discovered between the years 1947 and 1956, a very important uh, period of time to remember when we're looking at this. But what is significant and what makes this one of the if not the greatest archaeological discovery of all time, where these scrolls have been dated to be 1900 to 2200 years old. How would you like to see something that was being written and read and used at the time of Christ? That's the interest that we have as students of the Bible in these scrolls. Now this picture that we have on the screen at the present time is the picture of Jerusalem from the south. It's not a picture that you normally get because most people see it uh, from the eastern side. But this is from the south. And you can see the temple walls and you can see the uh, Dome of the Rock. You can certainly see that this is describing the city of Jerusalem. But the point that this makes for us is all about the facts that are related, and many of them related in this one sensational scroll they found of Isaiah. For in our 30, 43rd chapter, verses 11 to 12, we read, I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And what we're looking at, amongst all the other things it talks about and the other things that we can make of it, is this displays that there is a God that is alive, that is active, 
and that is bringing these things to pass just as those scriptures, thousands of years old as they are, had said. When you're in Jerusalem and uh, you're near the Knesset building, if you go off just to the side of it, you'll find a rose garden, beautiful garden. I would certainly hope that if you're there, you would take the time to walk through that garden. It is uh, not only just because of the roses, it's because also of the cypress trees and of the scent that you can get from those trees as you're walking through. I never, I never had such an aroma go through my nose in all my life as walking through that garden. It was a very beautiful uh, sensation. But as you can see, hopefully you can see on the slide here, through the trees is a picture of the shrine of the book, or at least a little top of the shrine of the book. And so from the Knesset building, you can clearly see the place where they have built for the Dead Sea Scrolls as a memorial. Now the land of Israel is a land of caves. You can't help but read the Bible. And uh, and when you read the Bible, to see the number of times it refers to caves and people living in caves and David being in caves and, and many people being in the same cave. It's really quite a place of caves. And not only that, but the idea of hiding things was, was uh, somewhat revealed already to us because hiding scrolls in a jar was not a new idea that people were using at the time of, of the placing of these Dead Sea Scrolls because we have that record that we find in Jeremiah 32, verses 13 to 14, where God tells um, God, uh, Jeremiah and Barak what to do. So Jeremiah says to Barak, I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. Well, that would be a nice vessel to discover. <laughs> Take the top off one of the jars and, and see that evidence in there, but you know that may very well yet happen. We don't know where that was located. And, um, but as you see the timing of the discovery of the scrolls that we are going to talk about in just a few minutes, you will see that the timing is very important to God and that he has done these things according to his plan and, and his, the evidence that he wants to lay before the eyes of the people of that particular time in history. Now, The supporting books, and I I really think you need to know this because some of these books are are hard to find. And uh, one of the the books there, which is called The Message of the Scrolls, may not look like you have in your screen, but this book, The Message of the Scrolls, is just another version of the the same book written by Yigal Yadin, and it's really an important book to have if you want to document the Dead Sea Scrolls. It tells you how he did it, and the number of things that were involved in these scrolls in Qumran. And then, of course, there is the one in Masada, and uh, in particular, a picture in there of finding the scrolls at Masada, which we'll talk about in a little bit of time. Also, when you're in Israel, in Qumran, looking uh, at the monument there about the people who actually hid these uh, scrolls and jars, you may find this little video. Now, sometimes you wonder when you're in one of these little stores as to whether any of these things are worth it. I would recommend you get this one. That is a very, very good documentary of of the finding of the scrolls and how they did the research to be able to read them. And then finally, uh, just another little thing while we're saying this, is this is another uh, little piece uh, of of evidence that I have brought back with me from Israel, from Qumran. It may be actually available in a number of other places around Israel. It's really worth having this. It gives you a document of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is a little jar inside, which uh, is something like what the jars would have looked like. It certainly wasn't the same size, but it uh, gives you an idea of what the, the jar that had the scrolls in was like. It would be quite a lot bigger than that. It had a little top on it, something like the Shrine of the Book has the same kind of a top on it. And then these scrolls were rolled up and inside. And the scrolls were very big. They, they went on and on and on. So uh, some of these scrolls, at least the ones that we're going to talk about in Isaiah, were about seven meters. 
in length, which uh, illustrates that, yeah, it would have been somewhat heavy and it would be a little bit hard to, to maneuver getting that thing around unless it was in the rolled condition. So those books may be available on uh, Amazon books, used books. And if you just look for those two titles written by Yigal Yadin, you might be able to come up with uh, something you'll really value in the future. You can't imagine that scrolls that were put in a jar like this or that were kept in anywhere for 2,000 years would be exactly, totally the same way they, as they put them in. And you can see that as they were unrolled, uh, they tended to decay on the edges. And uh, the edge uh, being, when it was unrolled, illustrated the sort of the pattern that you see on the top one and and certainly the decay that went into the bottom one. But they were... They all contain writing that to some degree was readable and they could tell where they came from and identify them that way. The Isaiah scroll is, was the masterpiece. And uh, when I went to the Shrine of the Book in Israel and uh, went into the museum there, they had it uh, all put around in a, in a nice circular exhibit, much like we had uh, not so long ago in the Bible exhibition here in Ontario. And the scroll that was wrapped around was not the exact scroll, but it was the same size, and it uh, was a photocopy to show all the marks on it. On the Isaiah scroll that you have in front of you, uh, where the pieces of leather have been stitched together, some of it coming apart, uh, but nevertheless clearly stitched. If you look at the scroll as you go around, you'll see where there were tears in it, and it was uh, likewise stitched up. You can see where the where the scribe made mistakes on it, and he uh, attributed, you know, some some new reading to it in the in the uh, margin. You will see that there are other marks on it, uh, which would seem that other people actually viewed them at the same time or in that period of time. And so, uh, yeah, it looks like it was well used. This Isaiah scroll. And that may be one of the reasons it was put in this particular place. Maybe, uh, as I'll, I'll show you a little later on, um, this wasn't found in what they would call a Geniza, per se, but uh, that would be a grave for the, uh, the old scriptures. But it, it certainly was put away, and it was put there for a long time. Whether they were trying to hide them uh, or what they had in mind, we're not exactly sure. So that's a little picture of the Isaiah scroll. Now the places of interest are up in the top northwest part of the Dead Sea area, in the area of Qumran. There was a lot of caves up there where they found them almost down to En Gedi. Uh, not quite that far, but going down uh, to the southern part of the sea. And then in Masada, they, they are the two scroll areas that I want to talk about because I think the scroll finds were sensational. And uh, you can see, I don't know if you can see it on the screen that you're looking at right now, but you see three little dots in the little circles illustrating it was an ancient site. It's a pretty rugged area, the northwest shoreline of the Dead Sea. Uh, you can see that in particular by looking at the little road that runs along the bottom. And that gives you an idea of, of uh, just how barren, but how spectacular the scenery is in that area. And uh, yes, there's water comes down occasionally in that area. So if you're driving along, you might even see a place where that road's washed out because rain at the top, not necessarily right in the area of the Dead Sea, but somewhere behind it where it would come down and flow towards the Dead Sea. Uh, going through those wadis tends to be a bit of a torrent by the time it gets to the bottom. It can certainly rip up a road and, uh, and uh, we were there to see where it was being repaired. The uh, interest then in the place where you're very likely to go is this place, Qumran. And uh, you can see here a, a bigger picture of it between two roadways, roughly where the location is. And off to the top left, you'll see the road that goes to Jerusalem. And then as it goes down to the right side of the picture, it's going down to uh, En Gedi. Now, at the time I was there, um, and this picture was not taken by me, but during that period of time, there weren't many people visiting Qumran. It was too dangerous. 
So where you might find many buses and many people coming and going in this, this little area, there's only one bus. And it just shows that's the way it is in Israel. Sometimes it's safe to go, sometimes it isn't safe to go. But uh, I, I tend to find that the Israelis have a, a different feel about it all than we do. One of the uh, things that I found was an outstanding feature of the year of 2014 was uh, the, the uh, computer giant Intel uh, was deciding to invest, reinvest in Israel again. And they were going to add something like $6 billion worth of investment to where they have this huge factory set up to make little chips for all of the electronic devices that we use. Well, the interesting thing is, that was a Gath. Now, Gath is very close to Gaza. And they had a war there. And they made this announcement about this big investment at the time that the war was going on. And there was missiles going over top of the building. <laughs> I just say that Israel has more confidence than you can imagine. And uh, so from their point of view, I think guests would always be welcome to come and to walk around these sites and visit even if there is thunder in the distance. So here is cave four. Now this is the one that we often see in pictures. Uh, some of the others are not nearly so attractive, but this looks like it would be nice to investigate, to go in some of those holes and just see what you can see for yourself. Well, if there was 19,000 fragments altogether in 11 caves, there was 15,000 found here. This was a library. And it looks like, as you can see in the, in the picture here, there's windows on, on this little outcropping that's closest to us. There's windows. And inside that area is all hollowed out. And there was, it looks like, places for racks or boards to go across from one side to the other side on which there would have been jars and inside the jars scrolls. And yet, it also appears that the, the Roman legion got in there and uh, they had no feeling about these scrolls or this library and they must have just trashed the place. But even after having it trashed and laying there for thousands of years, people today have been able to pick up those fragments and make some sense of them. And I think that is one of the really significant parts of this. One of the most interesting parts I don't know if you're allowed to walk in that place. We weren't, but if you are, I think it would be really worthwhile trying to, to see where you could go just to see that you'll, you'll keep that with you the rest of your life. It's been about 10 years, I think, now since we were in Israel to see this. And uh, it's just as current in my mind as it ever was. I use it in talks, and I, I use it to, to describe to my children all the time what we saw at Qumran. When we were there, we had uh, Brother Paul Billington and Brother Tim Billington with us, and um, we were doing some filming, because one of the things that always interested me is that if the Dead Sea is such a, such a, a, a dead place, how could this story be true about how the scrolls were found? And that was that some uh, little 12-year-old Bedouin was looking for a goat that had strayed, and uh, he threw a stone in a cliff and, and heard the, the crashing of, a, of some jar in there and uh, then went back at the next day to see what actually had happened. I thought, well, what would a goat ever be doing down here? Like, what's there to eat? And uh, that's one of the things that, you know, you always like to see, that there is some evidence that tells you that this is really right. Well, there's quite a few of them down there. And this little ibex uh, just from down the road at En Gedi is just uh, one of many goats that we saw once we started to see them. They were all over the place, even though that's the soil they were walking on. They knew what they wanted to eat and they could find it. The northwest shoreline of the Dead Sea, again, is, is really quite pretty and attractive in its own way. As you can see, the dark cliffs, you can see the spread out part of the, the northern part of the Dead Sea, which is really the only part now that has as much in the way of water in it. But when I went down to the Dead Sea, I was really surprised by the fact there were waves. The wind was blowing down the Dead Sea and the waves were coming up on the shore. And it was all covered with salt and that, and uh, it was really <laughs> something well beyond my expectations. The salt uh, was uh, 
very, very salty. I uh, actually had a, a chance to go in and float around a bit. To I think if you have a chance to go there, you don't want to miss that. You can't do that in your bathtub at home. You can only do that in the Dead Sea. But just don't get it in your mouth or in your eyes because it is very, very salty. Now, you see, that's why that other cave was much more attractive than this cave. But this is the sensational cave. This is cave one. This is the area where the discovery was first made. And you can see it's not a way up on the top of a cliff. Uh, it's quite logical that a, that a, a young lad could come by and throw a stone in, in a place to see if, if something happened. But, you know, you, you think about it. Just 2,000 years went by. Why wasn't there another 12-year-old, maybe 500 years ago, who did that? Now, nobody did that. Or at least nobody went in to see, because those jars were still there. They were still intact, except for the one that was broken by the stone. So you see, there really is something about the fact that they were so open that you could throw a stone and hit one, sitting there for all that time and, and never being disturbed. That's a, a significant factor in this. It yielded seven scrolls, which the people who have have uh, investigated it have described as the Isaiah A, Isaiah B, the Habakkuk Commentary, the Thanksgiving Scroll, the Manual of Discipline, the War Rule, and the Genesis Apocryphon. Well, you can see that, although you may be interested in, in looking at the uh, Habakkuk Commentary or maybe the Genesis Apocryphon, the real in, the real winners are the Isaiah A and the Isaiah B scroll because you see what we wanted to know at least I always wanted to know and I would think every Bible student wants to know is the answer to the critic who says you can't have anything like the original today well why couldn't we have anything like the original well they tell us that you just try copying something like the Bible and just think of how many times it would have had to be copied in 2000 years and you think it still contains what the original record was like? And they tried to convince people, the skeptics that is, that what we have is an unreliable record. So the most important thing for me in reading this was, what did this look like compared to what we have? Now, I don't want to give you my impression. I like to give you the impression of someone who knows a lot more about this than me. So let's just continue on with, with that investigation in sight. Now, this is the man. He is probably the most prominent person in all the Dead Sea Scrolls investigation. Yagal Yadin, the man appointed to be in charge of the scrolls. Now, this was no ordinary man. Uh, this man was a professor. He knew various languages, certainly the languages of the scrolls. He was um, a general in the uh, army at about the time of uh, the establishment of the State of Israel. And also, he I think was his, he got far up in the political system as deputy prime minister. So he was a very important person in many ways. And he has written a lot of things about this subject of the Dead Sea Scrolls because that was his fascination. He wanted to be an archaeologist and he was a very good one. So it makes more sense for us to go to a person like Yagal Yadin to find out what his opinion was, a person who could read these languages who could appreciate uh, the differences in the style of the letters of the, in the Hebrew alphabet. So it was a, a, you know, a, a pre-standardization Hebrew script that he was reading from, or more present uh, script. He could read Greek, and as a result, he, he was really into being able to tell us what these scrolls said. And this is what's written in one of those books, The Message of the Scrolls, as I mentioned it to, to you earlier. He said, I cannot avoid the feeling that there is something symbolic in the discovery of the scrolls and their acquisition at the moment of the creation of the state of Israel. It is as if these manuscripts had been waiting in caves for 2,000 years, ever since the destruction of Israel's independence, until the people of Israel had returned to their home and regained their freedom. This symbolism is heightened by the fact that the first three scrolls were bought by my father for Israel on the 29th of November 1947, the very day on which the United Nations voted for the recreation of the Jewish state in Israel after 2,000 years. 
Now, when I first read that, I couldn't believe my eyes. I'd never heard it from anybody uh, until I read the book. When I read the book, I first learned that, that it was actually occurred on the same night which the United Nations voted to partition the land. Now, you just think about this. Both of those events were very significant from the point of view of what God was doing with his people. First of all, he was, he was, uh, he had written this out, uh, giving it to the prophet Isaiah. It had been hidden, like uh, he had told Jeremiah to, to put that sail, the transcript of that sail in a jar for many years. He never said that he would put this in a jar for many years, but it's, see, it's like what God does. He put this in a jar for many years. He put it so open, it was, it was within a stone's throw breaking for 2,000 years and no one had ever been there and done that. But when they did it, it came to be that it was at the same time, same time that the world was deciding they would allow the creation of the Israeli state. You see, that was a window of time. You ask United Nations to do that today. If you ask United Nations to do that maybe five or ten years later than they were asked, they probably would not have chosen to do it because of the problems that arose as soon as they did it. But they did decide to do it, and now the rest is history. There is a state in the world called Israel. This connection of the two events, it means nothing to a lot of people. Like Yigal Yadin, that's all he said. And you know, that's significant what he did say, but that's all he said. And he was a Jew. He didn't see anything more to it than, it just seems to be something symbolic about this. But for Bible students, I think it goes well beyond that. See, this is the way God works. In Exodus 12, verses 40, 41, it says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. That's our God. Things that happened in the same day. So when you look at discovering of the scrolls and the fact that Yigal Yadin's father, all on his own, had to decide whether these things were forgeries or not. And they had already encountered people claiming to have scrolls that were forgeries. No one really believed that anything like animal skin could last out there exposed as it was for 2,000 years. But this man believed that what he was seeing was somehow or other the most ancient script he had ever seen in this life. And he mortgaged his own house to go out and to buy them at the time the first three scrolls were bought. That's the, that's the way God works. His will is done. The day had to happen. It happened. So you ask yourself, is this coincidence or is it prophecy being fulfilled? A scroll of Isaiah was placed in a jar in this cave sometime while the land of Israel was being destroyed by the Roman armies. About 2,000 years passed without the scroll being discovered or disturbed. Then, while one of the main prophecies in the scroll, that is the restoration of Israel, was being fulfilled, it was rediscovered in 1947. Well, this is my conclusion. This is evidence of the touch of the divine hand. And you know, that is how God works. There's not much out there in this world that you can say just, you just stumble on that, uh, you know, that illustrates that God is working and that, that God is, his word is being fulfilled, etc. But if you look for it, you find it. And many people would look at this and, and only see one aspect of it and only maybe if, if they could read these books and see what actually else happened, would then see the full import of what actually, the events of that time in 1947. I think that's really quite sensational. So when you look down on uh, Jerusalem from the air, um, I hope that you can make out uh, here, I'll just point to it, because the Knesset building is up over here, so you will probably be at the Knesset building sometime. And the exhibition, the museum, etc., is down here. The Sharanen book is right there. 
So it's going to be very close to a places where you will be. You don't want to miss it. I don't know how long you could spend in the museums there, but uh, I could have spent at least another whole day just in the museums, never mind the, the shrine of the book, looking at all the evidence there that they have discovered that really relates to the Bible. It's, it's a wonderful place to be. You can't be it there every day, but when you're there, make sure you use your time. The Shrine of the Book is an interesting place to visit because when you get up close, you sort of wonder why the person who did the artwork on this ever designed it this way. But yet, you know, it is, it is really, uh, really profound in its simplicity because it's just a big blank black wall. And behind it is a jar. And that simple, simple way of, of, of laying this out is exactly the way it was found. It, it just was not seen, but it was just right there, just that, that open and, and available. Now, there's a whole lot of other very interesting things that uh, go on in the, in the study of this, because the uh, Professor Sukenik was his name, who was the father of Yagal Yadnan. He had talked to um, to some of the people that were trying to, some of the the, the, the people that had, had looked at the, uh, the, the book. Uh, I think it was some, I can't remember the, the name of it, but it was an antiquities dealer of some kind anyway, who had got the scrolls from these Bedouins and had, it couldn't determine whether they were fake or not. So they had taken it to him because he was a, a well-known authority on ancient languages, and they said, well, can you make something of it? Now, this was, th this is incredible reading, because they had to talk to one another across barbed wire, because Jerusalem was a divided city. And the professor, Sukenek, decided that he needed to have these scrolls to look at them, so the, you, the, the antiquities dealer the Arab had to agree that he would give them to the Jew at a time like this. And he took them up and he looked at them and then he agreed that he would bring them back and he did. And he gave them back. And he, I must have just about broken his heart to give them back, but uh, that was the agreement. But then he decided he would buy them. And uh, when he bought them, he, he couldn't have rejoiced more. But there were four other scrolls and he didn't know what they said or what they were about. So he went about trying to find these other scrolls. Well, this shrine of the book, um, a picture here you see with the name Samuel and Jean Goatsman. That was the family that bought the other, well, they didn't totally buy them because it was worth $250,000 at that time. That was a lot of money. But they were the ones that initiated buying this. And so that's why they, their name is on the shrine of the book. But believe it or not, the, uh, the scrolls were found in the year 1947, and in the 1954, the, this ad appeared in a newspaper in New York, the Wall Street Journal. Four Dead Sea Scrolls, dating back to at least 200 BC, are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. Now, you can hardly believe this. These things were worth a fortune, but no one really knew that. And so the man was having a hard time selling them. And um, eventually, um, Yagal Yadin got wind that these things were actually being advertised. So he went through an alias and uh, a, different, a different name, but still sort of leading it to buy those scrolls. And uh, it was actually another wealthy Jew that provided the money and the nation of Israel was, was behind them because they could see what the other three were. They wanted the other four. So they eventually purchased all seven of them. Uh, I took this picture only to be told you're not supposed to take pictures there. So if you go into this place, just remember, remember that uh, they don't really like you taking pictures. So this is some of the things now that I think answer the questions that we would have as Bible students about the Dead Sea Scrolls. We read... Thus we know that even from this second source, the Septuagint, we have not full texts of the Bible earlier than the 4th century A.D. In the light of that fact, it is easy to appreciate the great importance of two Isaiah texts discovered among the Qumran scrolls. 
These texts are about a thousand years older than the oldest Hebrew text known to us and about 500 years older than the earliest Greek version of the Septuagint. So from the point of view of age, they are very, very helpful and very, very important because they stretch well back beyond anything that people had before. And uh, the interesting question, again, being, uh, what do they say in the Isaiah scroll compared to what we read today? What's the comparison? Because this is so old, this text could very well have been read by Jesus because he, uh, he, he would have quoted from these when he read in the, in the uh, synagogue, not necessarily this exact scroll, but from uh, writing that was at this particular time. So this is what Yigal Yadin had to say about the reliability. He says, what is astonishing is that despite their antiquity and the fact that the scrolls belong to this pre-standardization period, they are on the whole almost identical with the Masoretic text known to us. This establishes a basic principle for all future research on texts of the Bible. Not even the hundreds of slight variations established in the text affecting mainly spelling and occasional word substitution can alter that fact. Now, I don't think there could be anything that could be quite as comparable to, to that in terms of the answer we're looking for. Because here's a man who knows the language, has read the text, has studied these things, and he's saying, there is so little difference, there really isn't any difference. You would expect sometimes the punctuation to be different, the spelling to be different. Maybe the words are a little bit different. But the message is the same. It's a reliable text we have today. The Masoretic text is a reliable text. The, the version that we read from, the King James Version or whatever other version that, that uh, wants to be you know, critical about being exact would certainly be a reliable text for us to read today. We do not need to be concerned about the critic who says, ah, oh, you can't believe that. It's, it's just going to be too unreliable because of all the copying. Now, I think that is very, very reinforcing. Now, it's not it was as if it, w it wasn't challenged, because it was challenged. I remember reading this in the Toronto Daily Star, November 4th, 2006. And this was a comment that was being made. In fact, it was uh, a full page. So it was somebody was really trying to make the point that there was a Chinese connection between the Dead Sea Scrolls and he suggested, as I'll just blow that up a little bit, new discoveries from Asia suggest the Dead Sea Scrolls may not be as old as we think. And it was based on the fact that in this Isaiah scroll, they could see there was little marks that they couldn't explain. And these little marks, not being easy to, to figure out what they were, they thought they must have somewhere been some Chinese coding. <laughs> so, so they thought, well, someone's taken them out of their containers, taken them to China, or you know, somehow or other the Chinese have got to the Dead Sea and they've taken them out and they have changed them and then put them back. I'd say I'd rather believe the Bible message here. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And I never heard of that again. Never saw another article on that one. It, it seemed like most people couldn't buy into that. Now, there's something else about the scrolls that's really, really interesting. If they had found these scrolls a hundred years earlier, or any time between when they were put in, and up to, say, about a hundred years before they found them, they probably would never have been able to make out of them what we can make today. Now, I want you to listen to this, and this comes from um, a collection of what I found in the little kiosk on that video and in these books. It says, Today, scholarly opinion regarding the time span and background of the Dead Sea Scrolls is anchored in historical, paleographic, and linguistic evidence corroborated firmly by carbon-14 datings. Some manuscripts were written and copied in the 3rd century BCE, but the bulk of material, particularly the texts that reflect on a sectarian community, are originals or copies from the 1st century BCE. So before the Common Era. 
three technologies needed to develop, which didn't until about the 1980s, to be able to assist in the analysis of the scrolls. The infrared technology permitted the reading and copying of the scroll content. The DNA analysis permitted scientists to piece together which fragment came from which scroll. And carbon-14 dating provided the proof of the age of the scrolls. You see, if they didn't have that, oh, they wouldn't have believed they were that old. Somehow or other, they, uh, somebody faked it. Or they wouldn't have been able to read it because most of the scrolls were so decayed that when you looked at them with normal light, you couldn't see anything. And uh, the way this is explained on the video, which if you pick this video up uh, in the kiosk, I thought it was really neat the way you explained this. He said, you go down to the local store and buy three bags of potato chips, different potato chips. Like, you know, get, I, I don't know my potato chips, but, you know, you can buy ones that are normal. You can buy ones that are uh, some particular flavor and some maybe even look green. He says, get a big bag, three big bags. He says, when you get them home, take them and, and, and crunch them in the bag. So you get lots of potato chips. He says, then get a big bowl and, and put them all in. Mix them all up. So you got all these three bags mixed up. He says, take them and then scatter them all over the floor. And he says, pick them all up, which could be quite of a problem. Put them into the bowl again and then sort them out and put the, you know, the original potato chips here and the, and the, uh, the ones that have the flavor to them there and then put the green ones down here. And then he says, now assemble them back into their proper potato chip. I don't think anybody would be interested in trying to take that on. But he says that's about the size of the problem they had with 19,000 pieces. How could they possibly tell which piece came from which scroll? But you see, they were written on animal skins. And animals, animals have DNA. And by looking at these little pieces and finding out the DNA of the piece... They could match them. By matching them, they got them back to the skin that they were written on. And then, of course, the idea of infrared. Well, you look at these things under infrared light. So they all had to be filmed, and they, they filmed them in infrared light. All of a sudden, you can read it. All the letters are there. And that's really apparent in, in that uh, video where the man goes to try to describe that in detail. And then, of course, the carbon-14 dating... Um, all these are modern things allowed people to be as sure as anything with carbon-14 dating because the, the sheep's skin was carbon-based and they could tell roughly when that sheep was alive. So you could just see the hand of God in this. No one was going to touch those scrolls for 2,000 years. These technologies had to develop first, and it's in our era when they developed so we are the recipients of something that other ages probably would have loved to have seen, but never did see. We've seen it. Let's just move down to Masada to finish this, because uh, Masada is, uh, he, he went down to Masada, that is Yagal Yadin, uh, as the chief archaeologist. He went down to see if he could find any scrolls there, but they were more interested in finding the scrolls of the people that were there. They wanted to know, you know, who were these zealots anyway? Like, where did they come from? What, would, what did they believe? Were they really religious or were they, were they just people that uh, were the, the agitators of the community? Now, you will love being at Masada. It, it is really a significant uh, thing to, to be there. Just the scenery is spectacular. No wonder Herod built his palace there. But when you start to investigate, as you may see on the screen here, that uh, part in the circle, and that line, that white line that seems to come up, well, that white line has got a lot of history to it. You really want to maybe read about that before you go there, because the more you know about that, the more you will be able to, to look at the things and make, and make something out of them. There's a lot of Roman forts that are located around the base of Masada, which if you know what you're looking for, you can spot them right away. And then down more at the visitor's uh, place where you come in, you will see some of them are restored to what they feel was the, the way they looked at the time. <clears throat> now you can see a little bit there in that picture. You can see the ramp. That was where the siege engine went up to hammer the walls to break in. 
And uh, you can see something that looks like it's man-made down there in the base. That's where the Romans secured their, their, uh, their men at night. But uh, that was the 10th Legion and the work of uh, maybe a few thousand slaves that built that ramp so that they could take and move a, a siege engine up it and hammer the walls. And that's how they got in. I'll read this a little bit, and this might just entice you to do a little more reading on this. Uh, this is from his book, Masada. Masada shall not fall again. And it says, it is thanks to Ben Yer and his comrades, to their heroic stand, to their choice of death over slavery, to the burning of their humble chattels as a final act of defiance to the enemy, that they elevated Masada to an undying symbol of desperate courage, a symbol which has stirred hearts throughout the last 19 centuries. It is this which moved scholars and laymen to make the ascent to Masada. It is this which moved the modern Hebrew poet to cry, Masada shall not fall again. It is this which has drawn the Jewish youth of our generation in their thousands to climb to its summit in a solemn pilgrimage. And it is this which brings the recruits of the armored units of the defense forces of modern Israel to swear the oath of allegiance on Masada's heights. Masada shall not fall again. Now, when I was there, they were doing some work on restoring Masada to the point of, of doing a lot more. They were installing lights and they had quite a few other things that seems like in mind. And it might be that you could get a much better view of Masada than we could at the time that we were there. Uh, you might even take the snake path on the way up instead of taking the, the, uh, the little car that goes up the cables because um, you learn a little bit about the height of that place. Uh, we came down, we did not go up, but even coming down was a challenge. Now Herod made a palace there and uh, I've never seen it uh, even like it is in this picture because when we were there it was being restored but it, it didn't look anything quite as nice as this. Apparently he'd spent a lot and, and making this as it, it sounds, like a palace. And so it'd be really worth going there just to see this. It's a, a unique thing that you will not easily forget. What I'm mainly interested in, though, is that when Yagaliadin went there, he was trying to discover scrolls, and they did discover some scrolls at Masada. But first of all, they, they tried to find if there was a synagogue any place, and they did... Uh, think they had, had found one because it was facing Jerusalem on the wall, just as the arrow points here in the picture. Well, uh, Sister Dorothy and I went up to Masada not so long ago, and uh, we went here and found that now they have marked this place out at the top, so it's much easier to get a look at where this Geniza was. A Geniza is a place where they, they bury old books. Like, if what would you do if you had a Bible you didn't want anymore? Would you throw it out? Would you put it in the garbage? Not likely. It's probably still in your house somewhere. Like, I got quite a few myself. I, I, I just can't decide to throw it out, so I've got it. Maybe someone else will. But the Jews buried them. So they went into this place, and they looked around to see if they could see anything like a place where someone had dug something. And... Uh, and they couldn't find anything. So they decided to remove the floor of this little housing. And when they did, they found two, which looked like supporting pillar areas. But the pillars had been taken out because the floor was put there afterwards, it seems. And when they did that, they noticed that there seemed to be some material underneath the pillars, which illustrated that it, it might be worth digging. And, uh, you know, you don't know why people think these things. You really don't. But what they found, I think, was even more sensational when they found it at Qumran, because that's what they found. There was no jar. There was no scroll. But there was something that was once part of a scroll. And that's all it said. But they could tell by what it said that it was from Ezekiel. And they could tell that it was from Ezekiel 37. Now, I think that is the sensational part. Because the portions of Ezekiel's scroll containing the vision of dry bones, which were found in the second pit under the floor of the synagogue, now that's taken directly from a picture in this book of Masada. But what I would like you to see is just what the, 
what the text actually said in Ezekiel 37. I'm not saying that that's the text they could see. They could recognize it was Ezekiel 37, but I doubt very much they could see all of this text together like this because it was just too badly eroded. But look at what it says. Verse 11 to 14. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Don't forget, this is a Kenizah. This is where they bury things. Behold, they say our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Now, why men like Yagalyadin and others didn't just go through the roof for seeing this is because they really don't have this belief. You know, he, he, he thought it was kind of symbolic that these things were found there, but didn't really touch a, a nerve of conviction. But when we read this, and we think that here are people trying to find out if there were any scrolls that might be found in something that was going back 2,000 years. And, and so they, they look at a place which is in a synagogue and then a place which is a geniza or a grave. And they find something that says, I'll open your graves and I'll cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And they're in the land of Israel. I don't know what others, but I think every Bible student ought to see that that is significant. Because you see, that is our number one piece of evidence that God is at work in the world today and that he is working with these people of Israel. And it's not because of their might, their strength, their knowledge or whatever that they're in that land, but because it's God's will. He has a, a plan. And when the day comes, he's going to send his son back to do all the other things that this word of God says. So in summary, for this final slide, I'd just like to suggest to you that this is what I think these Dead Sea Scrolls mean to us. It illustrates the reliability of the biblical record. Surely it does. That here over 2,000 years of history, that the record hasn't changed. Don't believe those people who say you can't rely on the Bible because it's being copied and copied and copied and copied and no more reliable. It underscores where we are in the time according to God's plan because here it is, you see, the, 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 the people are back in the land. God has is, is, is got to that point in history where the people are coming back, but they don't yet see him to be their God. Something yet has had to happen in that land that the people will recognize that this God who wrote these things or God his servants to write them is in fact their God. It's a message of hope to biblical students. Of all the other stuff you see going on in the world, all the things that are discouraging, when you look in this area, you find hope to, to, to just continue there, to endure, to hold on for a little longer. And it gives us assurance that the other prophecies made in God's word about the return of his son, the establishment of the kingdom, and the great invitation that we have to be part of the people who will take and, and get in the front line of those who are coming to Israel in the kingdom age to learn about our God and to, to learn what, what uh, he wants them to know. I just think it would be just the most wonderful thing to participate in teaching people who want to learn, which would be, as I see it, and as you see it from God's word, that's what the kingdom's all about. Thank you.